Uh, it's truly my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Maria Maldonado. Uh, Dr. Maldonado graduated from Albert, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx and went to do her residency in primary care internal medicine at New York Presbyterian Hospital Cornell Medical Center. And right uh, before joining uh, the Mount Sinai Health System, she served as program director of the Internal Medicine Residency Program and Associate Chair of Medicine at Stanford Hospital in Connecticut. She was the chair of the Alliance for Academic Internal Medicine's Diversity and Inclusion Committee for two years and served on the Association of Program Directors of in Internal Medicine Council for three years. She joined the, our system in September of 2016 as a primary care physician and serves as a site director of the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai's primary care clerkship. Also, we heard that she practices in Yonkers. Uh, additionally, she is an associate professor of medicine and serves as director of education for cross-cultural and patient-centered communication for the Department of Medicine and serves as faculty advisor in the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Her research and clinical interests are in cross-cultural care and healthcare disparities implicit bias, medical education, and delivery of patient-centered care, and caring passionately for the underserved patient's population. Uh, and as you mentioned before, it's for me, it's a special pleasure to introduce you, uh, since also one of my favorite topics is the topics uh, that you are addressing today. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Carnavali, for that uh, very uh, nice um, introduction. And it is uh, really a pleasure uh, to be with all of you um, this morning. Although I really confess that I would rather be with all of you today in person. And I'm looking forward to that time where we can do that again, because I am hopeful that it is coming uh, soon. I also have to let you know how much I enjoy facilitating workshops on this very topic um, with uh, the interns of the, uh, the, the residents at this institution. Um, and uh, I wanna start by saying that today we're going to be discussing one simple thing that we all could do that would mitigate disparities and improve patient safety and increase, increase the likelihood that your patients will be satisfied with your care and think that you listen to and respect them. So if I were here with all of you in person today, I would ask you to raise your hands um, to tell me how many of you would like to be able to provide that kind of care for your patients. And before I tell you what you can do to do that, let me ask you another question. How many of you think that patients should have the opportunity to communicate in the language they feel most comfortable in, right? And if I could be with you in person, I'm certain that all of your hands would be up for both of the questions I've just asked. But if you are like your colleagues across the country, most of us do not practice what we preach. And in a survey of internal medicine residents that we conducted here across the entire Mount Sinai uh, health system, over 90% of them reported that they deferred obtaining formal medical interpretation at least some of the time. And as I've already said, we're not unique. There are multiple studies that have shown that medical students and residents get by without obtaining interpretation. So now as an internist, right, and I'm speaking to, um, I'm speaking to mostly, uh, you know, um, internists today, our words and how we communicate matter, and we're not surgeons, and that's not to say that our more procedural colleagues are not capable of great compassion and empathy. Well, of course they are, <clears throat> but I make this distinction, however, to underscore that as internists, we use our words as scalpels. And as an educator who thinks a lot about the ways that patients and physicians communicate with uh, one another, I'm very interested in how we wield our words. And by the way, it's a good thing that I'm an internist because I wouldn't have been a good surgeon. I can't even carve a turkey. And I consider it a real feat of de dexterity that I'm able to get a nasal swab to test for COVID-19. So um, I'm gonna put my slideshow now. I'm gonna share my screen. this over a little bit. 
Okay. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to caring for patients with limited English proficiency or LEP, as I'll be abbreviating uh, throughout this talk, as I've already said, I think that we would all agree that the most fundamental thing to promote outstanding patient-physician communication is to make sure that you're both speaking the same language. And the way to do that is to obtain formal medical interpretation if you don't speak the same language as your patient. And if you take nothing else from this talk today and you decide that you just wanna turn your camera off and take a nap, that is the one thing I'd love for you to walk away with. Now, I've been interested in what it means to care for patients with limited English proficiency for over a decade from an academic perspective, but from a personal perspective, I'd have to say that it began when I was in my late teens and early 20s when I began to serve as a cultural broker for my grandmother. And she was Puerto Rican, and while she could speak some English, her preferred language for communicating was Spanish. <clears throat> and she suffered from severe spinal stenosis, and I'd accompany her to the orthopedic clinic at Mount Sinai Hospital right across uh, the park, where she saw young residents who, whose faces changed from week to week. Formal medical interpretation was never obtained, nor was she told of her right to formal medical interpretation. And what complicated things is that while I'm betting that many of you have already assumed that I speak Spanish fluently, as I've confessed to many of the, uh, the residents um, at Mount Sinai West Morningside, I actually speak Spanish almost as well as a three-year-old child. But we muddled through and she was consented for her spine uh, surgery in English. And luckily nothing went wrong. So I have no disclosures to, de to, to declare. And these are the learning objectives for our talk today. Now today I'm gonna focus on three key points. And the first key point is that patients with limited English proficiency are subject to disparities, patient safety errors, increased cost of care, bias, and they experience suboptimal patient-physician relationships. The second key point that I'll make is that outstanding patient-physician communication that mitigates disparities is possible to achieve even in the face of language discordance between you and your patients. And finally, the third key point I'll be making is that systemic interventions are needed. So let's get into our first key point. Now, it's been said over and over again that the COVID-19 pandemic proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Black and Latino patients and those impacted by poverty and policies that foster inequity fared worse than white patients. And over 50% of the US COVID cases were in New York City. And these data were collected at the very beginning of the pandemic. And as you can see here, COVID-19 was more likely to occur in Black and Latino patients. Black and Latino patients were more likely to be hospitalized and they were more likely to die. And as this bar graph shows, Latino patients were slightly more likely to die than black patients. And while we can't make the assumption that it was because of language barriers, because of course many Latino patients are bilingual, it certainly makes you wonder. Now, you've all heard about the reasons that were proposed for these findings, right? That Black and Latinos are more likely to work in, a, in the essential professions, that we're more likely to have underlying illnesses that make us more susceptible to moderate to severe COVID-19 illness, more likely to live in crowded conditions, and um, didn't have the ability to socially distance and work from home. And many immigrants were not able to stop working during the pandemic because they weren't eligible for any of the state unemployment or, under, or for payments under the CARE Act. Now, when we consider the impact of COVID-19 uh, on patients with LEP, it is likely that language barriers got in the way of receiving information quickly and definitely impacted the ability to get access to healthcare as practices were moving to more virtual models. In fact, one of my own patients told me of difficulties that she had getting through to me. She was hung up on when she couldn't speak English. Now imagine, right, we're trying to obtain formal medical interpretation at a time where infection control practices include N95 masks, face shields, gowns, and patients too are wearing face masks. And in the hospital, they're in these isolated rooms where healthcare professionals wanted to limit as much face-to-face -face time as possible. <clears throat> 
Obtaining formal medical interpretation pre-COVID was already an inconsistent practice and COVID-19 exacerbated the problem. And there were several articles early on in the pandemic that was written in the popular press about these uh, barriers. Now, the other thing that happened is that the COVID-19 pandemic occurred in tandem with the public charge rule that under the prior administration was developed to help immigration officials determine whether a person was likely to overutilize public benefits like food stamps and Medicaid. And as you might imagine, these changes or uh, discourage many in the immigrant community from using charity-based care for fear that this was going to adversely impact their immigration status. And though a bulletin was put out by the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services that encouraged people to seek medical care for sy symptoms consistent with COVID-19, saying it wasn't gonna affect their uh, status, it's easy to imagine how this rule kept those uh, who needed care from seeking it. Now, over the past year, the academic literature has demonstrated the disparities that exist uh, for patients uh, from vulnerable groups as it exists uh, for COVID-19. Now, as can be seen on these slides, hospitalization rates and death rates are higher for Blacks, Hispanics, and Asians compared with whites, and patients with limited English profic proficiency had worse outcomes. And in this study uh, by Kim and colleagues, they demonstrated while patients with limited English proficiency were less likely, as can be seen here on the left, less likely to be tested for COVID-19, the proportion of COVID-19 cases were 4.6 fold higher in patients with LEP compared to those without it. And Karmaker showed that having limited uh, English proficiency was associated with increased risk of disease incidence, as well as a uh, higher mortality rate, as can be seen in that block in red. Now, sadly, while we now have a formidable tool for mitigating these outcomes, it appears that patients with limited English proficiency are experiencing uh, barriers to getting access to the COVID-19 vaccination. Right? And in Yonkers, where I live, the mayor took the step of designating a vaccine center in the heart of the poorest section of Yonkers and ensured that those who live in vulnerable zip codes had access to signing up for the vaccine a week before all others. Now, we might consider the approach of designating limited English proficiency as a qualifying condition for getting earlier access to the vaccine. And we might also consider looking in our practices and seeing which patients have limited English proficiency and doing direct outreach to them. Now, even before the pandemic, we knew that individuals with limited English proficiency face multiple barriers to accessing uh, quality care. And the literature is replete with studies that patients with limited English proficiency are subject to disparities. For example, patients with LEP are more likely to have poorly controlled hypertension than those with, limited, with, with English proficiency. They are less likely to have a usual source of care. They're more likely to have trouble getting through to their doctors. They are less likely to have preventive screening such as colonoscopies, mammograms, and pap smears. And patients with LEP are more likely to forego needed medical care and less likely to have a healthcare visit. Um, patients with limited English proficiency um, uh, there, there are increased costs of care associated with caring for patients with LEP. So uh, patients with LEP have longer lengths of stay in the hospital, they have a greater risk of readmission, and they have more diagnostic studies. Now, what happens when formal medical interpretation is used? In this recent study, they showed that by implementing ready bedside access to phone interpreters, this significantly decreased the readmission rate and interestingly led to over a million dollars cost savings. And when the intervention was removed, the readmission rate again increased as did the cost of care. Now, as you might imagine, patients with limited English proficiency are subject to patient safety events. 
and hospitalized um, LEP patients are less likely to have documentation of informed consent for common invasive procedures, and they're more likely to suffer serious patient error. They get improper prep for tests, and procedures, and they had a greater risk of line and surgical infections, falls, and pressure ulcers. Now, um, I, I want to call out uh, Dr. Sananda Moctezuma, who is doing a quality improvement uh, project at Mount Sinai West Morningside, and as part of some baseline data that she collected, she found that 67% of residents surveyed at Mount Sinai West Morningside reported that they witnessed a patient encounter where safety was impacted because medical interpretation was not used. It has been shown also that patients with limited English proficiency have suboptimal patient-physician relationships. And patient-physician communication is measured by whether individuals report whether their physicians always explain things in a way they can understand, show respect for them, and they listen carefully. So as can be seen here by this slide, the lines in red are patients with limited English proficiency and those patients are less likely to report that their medical provider always explains things in a way they can understand. They're less likely to report that their provider always listen in, listens to them. And they're also less likely to report that their provider always shows uh, respect. So how do we mitigate these outcomes of disparities, cost of care, patient safety events, and suboptimal patient-physician relationships? Well. <clears throat> the uh, Agency for Healthcare uh, Research uh, and Quality proposed key recommendations for improving care for patients with LEP, including the collection and tracking of language access needs, developing policy on language access need, and underscoring the importance of commitment across the entire healthcare system. It certainly requires a multi-pronged approach. So let's move into my second key point, which is that outstanding patient-physician communication can mitigate disparities even in the face of language discordance. So I'd, I'd like to dig into this topic by presenting a patient that I saw in my practice a couple of years ago, because I think it will illustrate this point very nicely, and also because I'm a lover of narrative medicine. And this patient, uh, my patient was a 70 year old woman and she had a history of lymphoma in remission. And she had, as you could imagine, received extensive treatment for her cancer. And she had changed to my practice mainly because of my last name, Maldonado, which I've already shared with you is a massive misconception. So she tried to hide her disappointment when I greeted her in English and I sought to reassure her in my limited Spanish, no no se preocupa, yo puedo coger una persona que pueda hablar español en el teléfono. Well, she decided to humor me. I obtained the formal medical interpreter by phone and we began. And after I obtained her medical history, I wrapped it up by asking, was there anything else that she thought that I needed to know in order to care for her? And here I was surprised to see that she had tears in her eyes. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, what had I missed? And what had I done wrong? And I asked her to tell me what was going on. And she said to me, this is the first time that I feel like anyone's truly taken the time to listen to me and get to know my history. That this was coming from a woman who was 70 years old, had overcome lymphoma and gone through complicated treatment. Well, this brought me close to tears as well. So how many of you believe that it is difficult to have a therapeutic relationship with patients in the face of language discordance between you and your patients? And over my you know, many years as a clinician educator doing this work, residents have told me time and time again that they think that it's not quite possible to develop a therapeutic alliance in language discordant relationships. And I think it's really important to take a moment to reflect on that thought, because I think that this thought impacts on the care that we provide to our patients with LEP. Now, the psychological literature informs us that our thoughts create our feelings. And this is the basis of cognitive behavioral theory, 
But most of us can't pay very close attention to what we're thinking as the 50,000 to 100,000 thoughts a day float through our brain. However, what sets us apart from other animals is that we as human beings have the unique ability to think about our thinking. And this is what is meant by the term metacognition. So what do you imagine that is, is the feeling that is yielded from the thought, a therapeutic alliance is not possible when I don't speak the same language as my patient? Well, we might feel resignation, if you're like me, you might experience the emotion of inadequacy since my name is Maria Maldonado and my patients expect me to speak Spanish. We might experience the feeling of hopelessness. We might experience frustration. Now I make this distinction because of course that thought is not a fact. There's an old saying that says, don't believe everything that you think. Now um, the only absolute fact and circumstance is that you and your patient do not speak the same language. And as I've said before, that fact leads to different thoughts, such as patients prefer doctors that speak the same language as them, or that it's not possible to have therapeutic relationships with patients that can't speak the same language. Well, what I'd like to convey to you today is that these aren't useful thoughts, and it's not a thought that's going to render positive outcomes. Because if we asked our patients if they'd rather have a language concordant physician or the very best physician to take care of them for the problem they had, if they were guaranteed complete understanding of what was going on, who do you think that they would rather see? Now, today I'm going to suggest that you consider what you've been thinking about when it comes to care for your patients with LEP. And another piece of this puzzle is that our feelings drive our actions. And of course, our actions engender our outcomes. So let's work this through. You have this thought, it is not possible to have a therapeutic relationship with a patient I can't speak the same language as. You might feel frustrated. And this action may be for you indeed to obtain formal medical interpretation. But it's likely that this action will not be sought joyfully. It's also possible that frustration may not lead to the action of obtaining formal interpretation because you may be feeling frustrated because you're thinking, I don't have enough time. So your action may be to use an ad hoc interpreter or try to get by with limited language ability or even defer seeing that patient if you can. So your outcome may be that you have frustrating encounters with your patients with LEP to say nothing of the outcomes for your patients. And since you're gonna have many encounters with patients with LEP, you may wanna rethink that approach because I suspect that this could lead to burnout. So I'm going to challenge you by asking you to consider a thought that might right, lead to more useful emotions, actions, and perhaps better outcomes. Borrow this thought. It is possible to have a meaningful connection with my patients with limited English proficiency. How about this thought? Ensuring formal medical interpretation enables equity for my patients. So we, I, I'd also ask you to consider asking yourself a question like, how can I have a fantastic interaction with a patient with LEP despite not speaking the language they, they speak? We will always get the answers to the questions we ask. So make sure you ask good questions and mind your thoughts. So I'm gonna push this a little bit further and answer the question, is language concordance between patients and physicians necessary to have good patient outcomes? Well, in a study examined quality of diabetes care for non-English speaking patients, they found that patients who were LEP and had diabetes actually had better outcomes when their physicians provided formal medical interpretation than those who spoke, spoke the same language as their healthcare professional. Another study showed that Spanish speaking patients in which phone interpreters were used were as satisfied with their care as those who had language concordant providers. Patients were less satisfied when family members or ad hoc interpreters were used. <clears throat> and in a scoping review to explore patient experience of LEP patients, the authors found that patients with LEP 
do wish to be cared for by language concordant physicians, but if this were not possible or available, formal interpretation is needed and significantly improves uh, patient satisfaction. So now what about health outcomes? A recent uh, uh, systematic review of patient provider language concordance and outcomes revealed that medication adherence is not associated with patient physician language concordance, that there is no association between language concordance and timeliness of treatment, and that there is no association between language concordance and shared decision making. They did find that there may be a positive association between language concordance and providers listening skills and feeling understood, but there was no evidence that between, um, there was no evidence that showed uh, between language concordance and likelihood to get vaccinations like the Tdap and the flu vaccine. So I hope at this point I've convinced you that formal medical interpretation is a major contributor to improving communication and will not only ultimately mitigate the disparities that exist for patients with LEP, but can enable a positive patient-physician relationship that engenders patient satisfaction and will make you feel better too. Okay, so we know this is true, but we don't consistently get interpretation when we need it. In a study that examined language assistance for limited English proficiency in a public emergency department, the calculated unmet need for, uh, for those patients was about 84%. So in this study, patients were asked by the registrar what their preferred language was and whether they wanted an interpreter. And 11% of those patients who indicated that they wanted language assistance were seen by a certified bilingual uh, professional and 5% had written documentation in the chart that interpretation was accessed. So we can assume that the healthcare professionals here were using limited language ability and were just getting by. This in the one of the departments of highest acuity and the critical need to triage patients appropriately. Now, it may also be that they just didn't document that they used formal interpretation. So another study showed that 66% of patients with limited English proficiency did not have documentation of interpreter use during, hospital, during their hospitalization. So this is a reminder to me to make a public service announcement that when you do use formal medical interpretation, you must document that in the chart. And if you are using your language ability to communicate with patients in that language, you must document that as well. So <clears throat> why don't we use formal medical interpretation? And perhaps answers can be gleaned from this qualitative study that was performed with medical students that explored the hidden curriculum as it related to the care of patients with LEP. And in this study, four themes emerged. The first theme was role modeling, where medical students spoke of the frustration that was demonstrated by attendings and residents who cared for patients with limited English proficiency. They spoke of systems factors, that there were inadequate interpreter services, lack of staff knowledge on how to access those services, and not enough identification in advance for those patients who needed it. The theme of learning environment came up and they noted competing priorities and the seeming low value assigned to patients with LEP. And then finally, the organizational culture in that some staff members seem to communicate that getting an interpreter went above and beyond standard of care, even though by the way, it is standard of care. So does any of this resonate with you? And, and what's empowering is that all of us here have the power to be a great role model and to demonstrate that all patients have value and have the right to receive inf in, interpret information in the language they prefer. And to be matter of fact about obtaining interpretation when needed. But what about the other factors? And this leads me to my final key point today, that systemic interventions are needed. So <clears throat> everyone in the healthcare system needs to know that patients have legal rights. And it is surprising that many of us are not aware of the law that governs rights for patients with limited English proficiency, although this law has been quite established for many decades. And when we did our baseline survey here at the system, 
only a third of the residents had ever heard of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination based on national origin, providing equal protection uh, for immigrants. And then in the 1980s, there was the executive order uh, 13166 that was signed by President Bill Clinton that improved access to services for patients with limited English proficiency. And the Affordable Care Act included a non-discrimination provision, section 1557, which built on the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and other federal civil rights law by extending non-discrimination protections. And up until this law, providing formal medical interpretation was essentially an unfunded mandate. And this changed with the passage of the Affordable Care Act. 15 states directly reimburse providers of healthcare for language interpreters, and New York happens to be one of those states. However, I have to point out that there was a new rule under the prior administration that came out from the Department of Health and Human Services, which rolls back some of these regulations, which will likely widen the gap for limited English proficiency patients. And federal funded entities will no longer be required to provide taglines on documentation that inform uh, patients of their rights to receive language uh, assistance. And also lack lacking language assistance programs are no longer gonna be considered explicit breaches of regulatory compliance. So there are also these national class standards um, that really uh, state that all organizations that receive federal funding should assure the competence of language assistance provided to LEP, LEP families by interpreters and bilingual staff. Despite this law, despite national standards, hospitals continue to fall short and often fail to inform patients of their right to, inter to an interpreter or to offer language assistance. Why does this happen? And in order to explain, I'd like to introduce a term that some of you may have heard about, normalized deviance. And Diane Vaughn, an American sociologist, first described this phenomenon of normalized deviance as deviance from normal behavior that becomes normalized in a corporate culture. <clears throat> and she described this as a process where a clearly unsafe practice comes to be considered normal if it does not immediately result in a catastrophe. And this was first described after the space shuttle Challenger disaster in the 1980s. Uh, I suspect maybe a little bit before uh, some of your time. And the root cause of this disaster was related to the repeated choice of NASA officials to fly the space shuttle despite a dangerous design flaw with the O-rings. In other words, this disaster could have been prevented. And this phenomenon occurs when people in an organization become so insensitive to this deviant practice that it no longer feels wrong. And in healthcare, workers don't make choices with the intention to create harm. It generally happens because of the barriers that exist to, to use the correct procedure, such as cost and time pressure. And typically we justify it as necessary that it's the only way to get by. Now, I would say here that we all have to take responsibility here because what is more deviant? Not obtaining formal medical interpretation each and every time it's indicated or not putting systemic processes in place to overcome the barriers that exist. So I have witnessed examples of normalized deviance in the sphere, in the sphere of patient-physician communication. For example, we give healthcare professionals 20 minutes to see a patient like this. An 82 year old person that you're seeing for the first time with a long and detailed medical history who maybe is hard of hearing and has limited health literacy. Well, if I sound a little bit bitter, it's because, well, I am. And germane to our topic here, we don't obtain formal medical interpretation each and every time for our patients with limited English proficiency and we don't vet healthcare professionals on their self-reported language ability. So why does this matter? Well, as I've said before, many serious medical errors result from violations of recognized standards of practice. So what I've just talked about underscores the need for systemic educational um, intervention, uh, interventions and initiatives. <clears throat> and despite the fact 
that um, most internal medicine residents across the country care for a significant percentage of patients with limited English proficiency, as can be seen here in this slide. Uh, this was a study that I conducted with some colleagues where we surveyed internal medicine residents across the country. We also found in that same study that many internal medicine residencies do not have a curriculum that's specifically targeted towards patients with LEP. So we wanted to uh, ensure an educational curriculum here at Sinai. So what we did was we first performed a needs assessment by surveying all the internal medicine residents at Mount Sinai Hospital, Mount Sinai West Morningside, and Mount Sinai Beth Israel on their behaviors as it related to caring for patients with limited English proficiency. We wanted to know whether they had ever deferred medical interpretation, if they were using ad hoc interpreters, what their perceived level of education was uh, uh, for caring for patients with LEP, whether they had experienced any frustration or stress when caring for patients with LEP. And then after we uh, collected that baseline data, we created a curriculum um, uh, on caring for patients with LEP that included informing residents about the known disparities, uh, patient safety, cost of care issues that I've just talked about in this talk, um, the legal rights that patients had, and how to effectively utilize formal medical interpretation. And then after that, we surveyed the interns that received the curriculum and we compared their pre and post uh, curriculum responses. And so here's what we found. And so you can see that the pre responses are those in blue, uh, the post responses are those in the, um, I guess you'd call that lavender, and the asterisks on top indicate that there was a significant difference pre and post uh, the educational curriculum. So you can see here that the LEP curriculum improved the, uh, the, in, the uh, resident's uh, perception of their didactic training. You can see that the curriculum increased uh, their awareness of uh, the legal rights uh, that patients had, um, that, uh, that they uh, were more likely to report informing of uh, limited English proficiency services, that they were more likely to use TeachBack, which is a, an ex, uh, um, a, uh, the best way of confirming that your patients understand what is going on. So they definitely had improved skills. But you see here that there was no significant difference in their likelihood to report that they had deferred uh, services. So again, uh, it increased their informing of an interpretation right, rights but there was no difference in their reporting that they use family members and friends to interpret. And certainly there was no difference, difference in their reporting that the pressures in of time interfered with their accessing interpreter uh, services. So education is a necessary intervention, but it is not sufficient. I'd like to say something about the importance of vetting your language ability, because there are some of you in this audience who do speak a language um, other than English and would think that you are speaking this language uh, fluently, right? But it is not enough to just uh, speak another language fluently. You need to be able to convey medical information fluently. But most medical systems do not have a system in place to vet those who state that they speak a language other than English. And in that study that I, that I told you about, we found that 85% of, of internal, medicine residents, uh, in, internal medicine residency programs across the country lack an evaluation process to assure that residents using a foreign language during patient care had the ability to do so competently. Well, vetting does serve a useful service, but in and of itself is really not sufficient. So in this study that was conducted of pediatric uh, residents, what they did was they vetted their language ability um, because they thought that, well, we will vet the residents and if they are found not to be competent, then they will be less likely to use their limited language ability um, in, in clinical encounters. And they did find that a little bit. As shown here in this slide, residents who found that they were not competent in that language 
they were less likely to use their limited language ability in straightforward clinical encounters, but there was no significant difference pre and post vetting in their likelihood to use their limited language ability in complex clinical encounters and clinical encounters uh, with legal content. So what about ad hoc interpreters, those staff that we often count on to provide interpretation in a pinch? Well, one study found that about 20% of interpreters at a large health organization lacked the bilingual skills needed to serve as interpreters in a medical encounter. Anecdotally, at one of our Sinai hospitals, I was told that 90% of those who applied to be certified as a formal medical interpreter failed the basic screening. Now, finally, we must address the barrier of time. And time has been cited as a challenge in caring for patients with limited English proficiency for decades. And we do need to acknowledge that in fact, it does take more time to care for patients with limited English proficiency and provide the needed resources to address this. And again, in that quality improvement uh, project that uh, Dr. Moctezuma um, is conducting, she found that over 35% of, of residents surveyed at Mount Sinai West Morningside reported experiencing frustration and stress when caring for patients with LEP. And these sources of stress included time constraints and technical limitations associated with formal interpretation. So to um, conclude, what, what might increase uh, interpreter use? I hope by now that you'll recognize that our limited language ability is not sufficient, that we need to recognize that patients are legally entitled to receive form formal medical interpretation. We need to appreciate that lack of formal medical interpretation leads to adverse patient outcomes and exacerbates disparities. We need to know that the use of professional interpreters is associated with improved clinical care. So I, I would encourage all of you to do the basic uh, work. And, and, I, and I send this message um, um, to, our, to our resident physicians, right? You know, to spend some time really reflecting on defining the kind of physician that you want to be so that we can work toward becoming the kind of physician that truly practices equitable care. And I would ask you to ask yourselves these questions. What policies do you wanna propagate and uphold? What do you believe that your patients need? Do you honestly believe in equitable care? And what does that look like for your patients with limited English proficiency? How do you know that you've achieved it? And how will you advocate on behalf of your patients? All of you, no matter what level you are in your training, um, all of us have the power to change a system just by shining a light on what we know is not right. Every time we look at the language field on the electronic medical record and we see that the preferred language is English, when we know that the patient does not at all speak English. Every time that we see a healthcare professional attempting to get consent for a procedure in the wrong language. Every time we use our limited language ability. Every time we realize that we are not being given enough time to do what's needed for our patients every time we throw up our hands and say, it is what it is. We may not get it right all the time, but we must incrementally move toward the ideal of what we imagine ourselves to be. So I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Farouk, and Dr. Sananda Moctezuma, all of whom who uh, have worked with me in developing the curriculum and we continue to do uh, what I consider this very special work. Thank you for your time this morning and I, I hope we'll have some time for questions. Yes, thank you very much Dr. Madonao. I think we have uh, five minutes for questions. Uh, we have one on the chat. She's uh, Melissa Wiener from IV. She says, one challenge that I've run into with my patients who have LEP is being sent my chart messages in their primary language. I'm not aware of any efficient mechanism to communicate through my chart on in our system. Any thoughts or, re or recommendations? Yeah, this is this is uh, there's a, a ton of um, there's a, a, a ton of opportunities for quality <coughs> improvement in this in this particular area. 
And so I'm not really, I'm not really aware um, of, you know, the mechanisms of being able to do that at this time, but I know that attention is being focused in this area. I should tell you that if you go to the Mount Sinai website now, you can actually get all of the information on the Sinai website in any, almost any language that you might imagine. So as a, as a way of experimenting with that, for a while, I was only able to access Mount, Mount Sinai information in Arabic. And I was having a difficult time <laughs> switching that around. Um, uh, I was finally successful at being able to do that. So we might inform our patients that you can get that kind of information, uh, but I think that we need to, um, we need to highlight information and to, to perform quality improvement projects in that area. I had a Dr. Martin Adam, sorry. Yes. Go, Jesse. Okay, um, thank you. Um, well, thank you very much, Dr. Maldonado. This was a really wonderful talk. And I, I had a question, but I just wanted to say my experience as a primary care physician in Harlem for many years with many, many patients who speak Spanish and other languages, but I, I don't speak Spanish. I use an interpreter all the time. And some of my closest, most meaningful relationships are with patients who don't speak English. And um, my question is, I sometimes patients who speak a little English feel reluctant to ask for an interpreter because they want to assert that they can speak the language of English, that they can communicate, they feel somewhat um, bad about having an interpreter. So I think there's also a need to among patients to um, encourage the community and, and patients in general to assert their rights, to ask for an interpreter, to that that's not, that that's important in terms of their medical care. Yes, I, you know, so thank you for, uh, for that wonderful comment and, um, and for that uh, important question. You know, just a, a quick response to that comment. I have to say that many, I use a formal medical interpretation all the time with my, with my Spanish speaking patients. And I will tell you that um, they start bringing their family members to me, knowing that I don't speak Spanish. Okay, so as you said, some of my most wonderful um, and close um, uh, relationships have been with those patients. And many of those patients started off by bringing family members to interpret. And I have gotten the interpreter and the family members don't come the next time around, right? So it, 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 it just goes to show you. Um, what I have found that those patients with, um, who speak some Spanish, and I mean, sp speak some English and I speak some Spanish, you know, um, what I tell them is I, I say, I wish that I were able to speak Spanish as well as you speak English, but if it's okay with you, it is so important for me that I understand everything that you were saying. Mm -hmm. And so important to me that you are able to express yourself in the language you feel most comfortable with. So if it's okay with you, I would love to, to have the formal medical interpreter as, as a backup. Is that okay? Yeah. And many, and, and a lot of times it's really coming from a place that people don't want to be a burden on, on the right. system. They feel very uncomfortable that they are putting you out. And that's why we need to be very matter of fact. And we need to convey that um, it's a privilege to be able to communicate in the language that they want to communicate in. And that, um, and, and, and we need to understand what's going on, right? Absolutely. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Dr. Um, Maldonado, we have time for one more question from oh. Dr. Doreen Mensa. And I just want the audience to know that following Dr. Mensa's question, we're going to uh, observe a moment of silence in, in recognition of the one year anniversary of the World Health Organization declaring a pandemic with COVID. But Dr. Mensa. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. This was fantastic. Uh, my question to you is, uh, knowing that having a formal interpreter is um, essential and necessary. However, the time constraint, uh, and I, I'm one of the internal medicine um, faculty members, and I also precept residents in clinic, is the time that they're given, knowing that it takes a long time to to interact with someone that you need to have an interpretation for. From a system standpoint, hmm. how are we going to change that? Because that is a very significant limiting factor that is impacting uh, 
how residents feel. Once you have a bad exchange and you have several patients who need interpretation and you need to be somewhere else at whatever time, it becomes um, onerous. So, so I would say very quickly in the remaining 30 seconds that we have, that systemic interventions are needed uh, at Stanford Hospital. What I used to do is I, if, if we had several patients on the panel with limited English proficiency, residents saw less patients. We offered more time, right? Okay, I, I ask for, as a primary care physician, more time for patients with limited English proficiency, and we have to advocate for that. There are cost savings to be had on the other side. And we need to look for those cost savings. Agreed. Thank you. Dr. Maldonado, thank you again so much. It was really wonderful to have you. Um, I didn't say, you know, I, I think many of us are so aware of, of this important work that you're doing. And also just want to really thank you for calling out the wonderful work of Dr. Moctezuma. We're really proud of her and really proud of her contributions in this important area. So thank you again.